to be part of our. Say got and, it. Uh, Click on got it. Excuse me, and being part of our Zoom tonight. Um, I had, uh, Mark, I'd like to share a screen if you don't mind. Yeah, you're a co host, so you should be able to share easily. Okay, so I go down to share screen. Yep, Bert. And I go ahead and put share. And then, do you, there see, it these is. Do you see these documents? Well, yes. All right. Um, the one, we've got the rolling ball of doom here. There we go. Um, I had prepared a little bit of a, of a uh, display here with Vin um, to show his handsome face and the fact that uh, he has uh, been a person over the years of uh, astonishing accomplishment and influence in the world of track and field. Uh, he came to national uh, uh, notification, I believe it's fair to say, as head coach of Stanford, then moving on to the University of Oregon. And now he's the head coach at the University of Virginia. But Vin has been uh, highly influential in developing interest in track and field. And his coaching abilities are uh, among the best. He has a great ability to communicate with people and to bring out the best in them. Uh, and uh, this is something that I don't want to take time to read, but as you can see, Vin's uh, resume is quite extensive, and the list of awards and recognitions that he has uh, earned is long and honorable. And then at the bottom of the uh, compilation that I have are championships that Lynn's NCAA teams have been, excuse me, have uh, accomplished. On the other side are articles that uh, I had come upon that talked about the world championships. And these are ones that I think you would find of great interest. There's one from a local radio station in Eugene, KEZI, which talks about the attendees uh, and the uh, effect of the world championships on local businesses in Eugene and uh, gives it a little bit of a personal uh, face to it. The next article says Oregon 22 World Athletic Championships um, written by a fellow who's at the Oregonian. Uh, the email, uh, the e-edition is Oregon Live. And again, it talks about attendance too and about how there was a little bit of concern about what was going to go on with the worlds due to the uh, low attendance at the USATF championships. But I think, you know, realis realistically, people were all keyed up about the uh, worlds. And so it tended to eclipse anything that was coming before it. Um, we have um, an article here about the four, four special events that had occurred during the worlds. And this was only up to, uh, um, uh, well, I'm getting that mixed up with something else. This, uh, this talks about world records that had been set uh, and the accomplishments by uh, uh, our, our respective athletes, in particular, the world record set by Sidney McLaughlin and then also uh, Mondo Duplantis, who was using the Sergei Bubka method of uh, setting world records by one centimeter. Um, my wife had commented about how Sydney had been presented by Lord Sebastian Coe with a $100,000 check. Surely that is uh, going to help pay for some traveling costs. And then there is an article about track and field worlds come to Eugene, an unlikely alliance six decades in the making. And that one mentions Vin quite a bit because of the influence that he has had in promoting track and field and of helping to bring uh, the championships to Eugene. So with that in mind, I'd like to turn it over to Vin now for some opening comments of his. Welcome, Vin. 
Thank you. And uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, you know, I, I think all that stuff that you've uh, shared the screen with and accomplishments and newspaper articles and all that stuff, I think maybe even some of it's even true. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here and happy to spend some, spend some time with you and talk about a project that was many years in the making. And I think a lot of people think that it just came about uh, because we presented a bid to uh, World Athletics or at that time IAAF. But truthfully, it started in 1995. Um, I was at Stanford uh, and I was approached by the people in the Bay Area to be able to conduct the World Championships at Stanford. And we put a bid group together. I was one of the people who bid. It was going to be in Stanford Stadium. And we had gotten a lot of, um, we got a lot of uh, traction with the university and some of the other stakeholders. In the end, we bid for 2000, uh, for 19, the 1999 World Championships. And I remember that Mr. Knight and Rudy Chapa went over and met with, at that time, the head of the IAAF, who was Primo Nebbiola, and they gave them a presentation about coming to the United States. Um, they, in the end, we didn't get to the first round. And uh, the United States was unsuccessful with that bid. We reconvened and tried to, and it was, it went to Sevilla. Uh, it reconvened and we bid for 2001 and it went to uh, uh, Edmonton. And we figured, well, if it's in North America, that's going to be the end of it. And when I arrived at, uh, at, at the University of Oregon in the first within 20 minutes of uh, concluding my comments at a press conference when they introduced me, they hustled me in a car and I went up and I met again with Phil Knight. That was probably the second time that we and he and I got together. First it was in 95 and then again in 2005. And we talked about our first 100 days. And if you know Phil Knight, Phil Knight likes to get to the point. He said, so what are we doing in the first 100 days? And I said, we're going to bid for the Olympic trials. And I will take a breath here and let you know that that meeting is when we made a decision in 2005 that the World Championships was in the, poss was in the realm of possibility. So I'll stop at that point. And uh, what would you like me to speak about specifically? Well, if you can uh, carry on from there uh, in that interesting vein about the uh, details that led to the fruition of the championships being held in Eugene. I, I, I think that would be a great way to, to uh, continue, Ben. So when I met with Knight and he wanted to know why would we, who cares about the Olympic trials as it relates to the University of Oregon winning championships? And my comment was really a bold one. And that is University of Oregon needs to get back in the business of hosting meets. Uh, the University of Oregon had not hosted an NCAA in a while. They had not hosted the Olympic trials in, since 1980. And uh, here we were going to bid 28, for 28 years later, the Olympic trials at Hayward in 2008. We hosted them in eight. We hosted them in 12. We hosted them in 16. And we hosted them again in 2020. But in that conversation, after we hosted this Olympic trials in eight and 12 and the world juniors in 2014, we, I talked to Knight again and I said, what do you want to do next? And he said, world championships. I said, world championships in Eugene, Oregon. How are we going to do that? And I said, there was, we don't have a big enough city. We don't have the hotels. We don't have a facility. Uh, we don't have a big airport. And he said, with that crummy attitude, of course, we'll never get it. Um, <laughs> so I adjusted my attitude and um, we, bid for, we bid and we're successful for the 14 World Junior Championships, the 2016 Indoor Championships in Portland. And although I never thought it would come, we just concluded the greatest track and field meet on U.S. soil that I have ever ever seen. 
And um, it's in no small part due to many of the people who are on this call today. And many, you're probably sitting there and saying, well, I didn't really have anything to do with it. Yes, you did. You attended meets, you built on the history of Eugene, Oregon. You came and you attended Tracktown Tuesdays and you came to Tracktown Fitness and you helped us officiate the Pac-12s, the NCAAs, the World Juniors, University of Oregon meets. You cheered for all of our athletes when they went one, two, three in the NCAAs in 1500 meters. And you helped to cheer Keisha Baker winning the NCAA four by four in 2010 or 11 or whatever that was. Um, that's what also, I hope all of you had take a great deal of pride in what you've done. And I'm looking at Bill Kelly's screen behind him and looking at that magnificent facility that will forever be the, uh, the trademark of Trackdown USA. Um, Vin, uh, it's hard to imagine you uh, with uh, uh, being accused of not having a, a, a proper attitude. I mean, if anybody pushes for something, uh, surely you're among the top ranks. Um, I, you were just trying to give a little bit of a, of a, a dose of reality to the situation. Um, one of the articles had noted that there were um, some... Um, uh, well, there's a lot of work that was being done by uh, the parts of businesses to prepare for the worlds and to make sure that everything was stocked and well taken care of. And one of the articles mentioned that there were some, um, uh, th there was there were fewer people than they had intended uh, to see or that they had hoped to see. But as the um, as the week moved along, uh, word spread about where people were and what. Uh, what was available in Eugene and, and people uh, from all over the world commented about what a pleasant place Eugene is and how wonderful the reception was that was given people. And they came away with uh, a very pleasant taste of what life was like in this area of Oregon and in particular Eugene. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's, there's a lot of discussion about uh, Oregon being, you know, Eugene being too small, uh, not having the, uh, the population that was needed uh, to be able to host a world caliber event. But I promised, I promised that when we delivered the bid to council in, and we did that in 2014, in November of 2014, we had a great team. We had people from USA track and field. We had Kate Brown, who at that time was the secretary of state. She was not the governor. Uh, we had Allison Felix, Ashton Eaton, Hisham El Garouche, Michael Riley. Uh, we had a, a, a group together and we met with council and we presented Eugene for what Eugene is, a place that has a love affair with our sport. And I think what people have somewhat forgotten is this was a bid to bring the world championships to the United States of America, not a bid worrying about where, what city it was. If um, we were the bidder and the world athletics made the decision and we presented it, that it would be an athlete friendly event. And I think we checked that box in every in every single category and they certainly for those of you who either attended the meet or watched it on television uh you saw phenomenal performances and enthusiasm and excitement from every single kid that went to the line or stepped in a circle or got on a runway and uh they performed brilliantly and uh so that was you know we we presented oregon as the place that would be suitable to host the, the greatest athletes on the planet. Yeah, it was a decision very much exonerated. I'd like to open it up now for people to make comments about what Vin has been chatting about, and in particular about the, 
what had happened in Eugene and, and uh, uh, you know, what your observations were. Uh, so please don't, uh, don't be shy. Uh, yes, you have, you have the ability to unmute. So you can unmute, ask your question, and then we'd ask that you please go back on mute so we can all hear the answer. Well, I'm going to call on somebody. I'm going to call on Bill Kelly to lead us off in this discussion. He's the head of, he was the head official for High Jump. Um, well, thank you so much, Scott. <laughs> um, yeah, so then um, I guess uh, I might uh, ask for your vision of how you see this as a springboard to continue with more interest in track and field between now and uh, the LA Olympics in 28? Uh, Bill, that's a, it's a great question. It's a question that all of us are asking. And as of yesterday, uh, one day after the, or today's two days now, after the world championship closed up and the truck started leaving, uh, that really is the fundamental question because here's what ha here's from my perspective uh, what happened. We could we scored the United States won 33 medals, and that is the greatest number of medals ever won by a United States team in either the Olympic Games or the World Championship, except for the boycotted one. And I would say this that if we, if the United States won 33 medals in Paris or Berlin or Doha or Daegu or London, it would have been short-lived. People would have been excited. They'd have been jumping all over the place with the one, two, three finish in the hundred, uh, a one, two in the 110 hurdles, uh, a one, two, three in the shot put. Uh, a, they would have been, but it would have been, short-lived and I'm, I'm hoping that what we will be able to do, and I hope what has been done, there were 43 hours, I believe, of television, always live from Eugene, Oregon and looking at that stadium. I just met with the Junior Olympics group today. I'm in Sacramento right now, actually. And I met with the JOs and I'm not sure if there's one kid that's here that doesn't want to be on that track. And those kids are, the youngest is seven years old, and the oldest, I think, is 17. Well, that's the generation we need to excite. All of them were exposed to what happened in Eugene. And what we need to do is be able to get those fan, get those kids to participate in the sport and get the, the athletes that just did those performances to be to become their names to become household ones. And so the steps, how do we do it? We have to market it. We have to get our athletes to be at the ESPYs. We have to get our athletes to be uh, highlighted at the Super Bowl. And we have now the content to be able to get the general public to be interested in the sport. And there's a strategic plan for USA Track and Field with key performance indicators of what we do over the next six years. Um, I was at a dinner the first night, um, uh, Bill, and at the, at the dinner was uh, Thomas Bach, the head of the IOC. There was the new chair of the uh, USOPC, the current chair of the USOPC, the CEO of the USOPC. Of course, all the council members from World Athletics, including Seb, um, and everybody is focused on the things that I've just just referenced. So um, we need to first make sure that we have continue to have meets and fill that beautiful stadium. And we need to be sure that it's broadcast through all the medium challenge, medium challenges, not cha uh, channels, not just television. Uh, if I don't know if any of you follow uh, Sidious Mag which is basically a podcast by a couple of young guys that really creates some pretty cool content, but that's appealing to kids. And that's the thing that we have to do. And uh, 
I'll talk in a minute about a couple of misses that we had with the world championship, but for short, short haul, those are the things we need to focus on. How do you spell the one uh, thing, Sidious Mag? C-I-T-I-U-S, second word, Mag, M-A-G. I think it's short for magazine, Sidious Magazine. Okay. And it's hosted by Chris Chavez. Chris is probably in his 20s. He teams up with Kyle Merber. Both of them went to um, Columbia. They teamed up this week with John Anderson from Sports Center. And they had Mac Fleet. You all know Mac Fleet, who won the NCAA, has graduated from the University of Oregon. And they put the content together and they interviewed. I went on there, and typically that's not my thing, but I went on. They had Michael Johnson um, on, uh, who did the broadcast for, um, uh, for World Athletics. Uh, so Cities Mag does a good job at connecting the young kids. That was one of the great moments of the track meet when Noah Lyles had beaten a little bit of a delay uh, uh, notification on the board. Uh, Michael Johnson's uh, 1996, uh, what was then world record. That was really something. 1931, man. And to have Michael up there in the stands and able to come down and, and greet uh, Noah, that was, that was very special as was the ability of the father to call his son's victory in the 1500. So those are really electrifying moments of the world championships. Other people to uh, make uh, comments, please. Hands up. If, if nobody is going to speak up, how about Connie? You take yeah, it on. I, I spoke up. This oh, okay. Connie after, after this. Go ahead. This is John. Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, Ben, welcome to Sacramento. It's nice to have you in town. Uh, as all of us know, uh, this was the first time the World Championships were ever held in the United States. But what has to happen such that this is not the last time the World Championships are ever held in the United States? What what are the pieces that need to be put in place so that one of these years, obviously after the Olympics, the world championships can be held here again? Yeah, I think here's, here's my take on that. And I think it's really important that we do host the world championships again. And we did host the world juniors in 2014 and we hosted the world indoors in 2016 and we'll be hosting the world cross country in Tallahassee next year. So I think that every time the United States can bid for one of these world events, it keeps us, it keeps us, um, it, it keeps us in, uh, in focus as opposed to what we've done for the last 50 years. And that is have the NCAAs, have the US championship, then everybody packs up and goes to Europe. And we never, uh, and, we, and we never really keep people's attention on our athletes uh, throughout the year. So for me, what needs to happen is I think another city in the States needs to bid. And I believe if they do, I truly, and I, and I think it will happen because in 2008, when we bid, there were only two bidders for the Olympic trials. It was Sacramento and they were a lock to get it. And then I went to Helsinki and I was able to convince USA Track and Field to just give us a chance to get our bid together. We had one week to put the bid together. Now, we got the uh, Olympic trials. We then bid for it again in 2012 before we even hosted 2008. We got it in 11. And then the next time the bids were open for 2016, they had 14 bidders. Mm. And then for 20, they had 15 bidders. So my hope is the only two places that have ever bid for the World Track and Field Championships are Stanford and Oregon. And we had no bidders against us when we bid, for, when, we bid when I was at Stanford and we had no U.S. bidders uh, for 2000 and it was supposed to be 2019 was the original bid. So my hope is that places like Sacramento, L.A., uh, New York, 
Chicago, Philadelphia, all places that have the infrastructure to be able to host the world championships will put their bid forward. LA, you know, and I, I don't know who's on this call that speaks to the people in LA, Casey Wasserman, who's the head of the LOC in Los Angeles. He was at that dinner and I told him he needs to bid for 2027 or 2029. And we should have the world championships in the United States again. Lord Coe seemed to kind of downplay some of the uh, Oregon meat, saying, you know, if it's coming back to the U.S., it has to be a bigger city, Chicago, Miami, whatever. But what he had to be very um, pleased with the way that the meat came off. He, uh, Vin, did you have a chance to talk to him and get his reaction? Yeah, I talked to him quite a bit, but I think, you know, Seb is, is a good guy, uh, but above all, he's the president of World Athletics and he's a politician. And um, I can tell you after spending uh, two years trying to get the Oregon legislature to pass a $40, $40 million uh, tax to be able to help support the world championship, I have a strong distaste for <laughs> the, the politics. And I think, uh, what Seb was probably addressing uh, is the importance for world athletics to be in major cities. Um, I think you know, until the metrics come out, like I, my, things are being, uh, are being uh, slipping out a little at a time. Like for instance, they're talking about the TV ratings, which theoretically were really great. They're, the TV ratings for world championships in, uh, in Eugene, basically either two and a half times any meet that's ever been held in the United States. It out, uh, it out uh, rated uh, Wimbledon. Uh, so I think we did, a, I think we did a pretty good, I think we did a pretty good job at that. So I think Seb has to be happy with it, but you know, in the end of the day, he's got to talk about five-star hotels, He's got to talk about a major metropolitan area, but if I had to, if I had to vote, if you asked me to vote on LA or Eugene, I vote for Eugene every time. I had uh, seen Lord Coe up close and personal. Uh, Vin, you'll, I think you'll get a kick out of this story. I was on my way out of the stadium and I had just looked over the, the uh, media uh, complex that's in the basement down where the pole vault um, uh, practice area is. And he had somebody in front of him, the security guard there was doing a very good job of what he was supposed to be doing, which was to keep people who are non-credentialed out of the area. And the person who was in front of Co had no credentials. And I can't tell you uh, for sure if Co even had his credentials on or not, but he was not too terribly pleased to be held up by the security guard. But uh, this fellow was just doing his job and he did it real well. Um, there's a question by Rich of Shorenstein of Colorado. What was done differently in terms of officiating at the world championships that we could adopt for use in the U.S. So this is a uh, now something that addresses the uh, actual officiating of the event. So does anybody who was uh, there or who was even, you know, if you weren't there, do you have any input about what Rich has asked about? What was done differently in terms of officiating? Well, Scott, I would say from my perspective, um, World Athletics was not prepared for the level of knowledge and skill that our people brought to the job. Uh, I think they were they were their thinking was that they would have to come in and and provide all the guidance and basically run the events as opposed to the event chief uh, taking charge of 
making sure that things were set up properly and that people were, things were where they were supposed to be and <clears throat> that we were doing our job. I, I uh, in speaking with the Seiko guys who I worked very closely with um, as far as electronic measurement goes there, that was exactly their take as well. Uh, normally they go into other, <clears throat> to other venues and they don't encounter the level of experience and the level of expertise and the level of knowledge that all of our uh, crew brought to uh, brought to the world championships. And I think that was a big surprise for them. Many of the um, ITOs that I interacted with basically backed off and they said, you guys know what you're doing. We're just, you know, we're just basically playing referee and we're just basically here in case something goes wrong or to provide guidance or to assist with timing with television and, those kind of things. But I don't think, I think the biggest surprise was they were not, they didn't think or were not prepared for the, our, our level of skill. Um, I don't, there was nothing that stood out to me, honestly, that we could do that, that we do that is any worse uh, than what their protocols were. And I don't, there was nothing that stood out to me that said, wow, we really need to, from my perspective, wow, we really need to adopt that. And we really need to do that here in the States. I, there was nothing that, that I saw that really wowed me in the way they do things procedurally. The equipment, yeah, I mean, having the Mondo uprights was, was pretty cool. And, and you know, some of the other, the, uh, the VDM for the horizontals in his shot, yeah. But, um, I, you know, when you, when you take that out of it and you take that money side out of it, uh, for you know, buying that equipment procedurally, I think there was nothing that I saw that they really brought to the table that any of us could look at and say, "Wow, we really need to do that." That's just my take. Uh, Rich, uh, in in um, in following up a little bit on what Mark had to say, um, it was kind of a humorous situation where a, a cameraman was set up. Uh, to take video of the hammer. And I uh, heard him say, I'm all set up for tomorrow. I'm all, everything's in, in place. And so I looked at the hammer cage and I looked over at him and I said, really, is this where you intend to set up? And he says, yep, that's what I'm going to do. And I said, well, you take a look at that, that panel on the hammer. That's set up for a left-handed thrower. And most people throw right-handed. So that panel is going to be open and your camera is going to be right in the way. And he got this look on his face and um, had to go off and, and find out if what I had just gotten through telling him was okay. But had he just been there the, during the hammer, he might have gotten smacked. Um, now, the cameras, there are multiple cameras that were set up for the world. So you've, geez, you've never seen as many cameras as they have. And you're always aware that you are um, possibly in the way if you stand just anywhere out in the field. I was one time told when during warmups that I needed to move, that I was in the way of the camera. And it's just something I hadn't even thought about. But, uh, you know, I obviously had to adjust what I was doing. But one of the things that the cameras do is enable a review of an attempt, even after, you know, a, 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 a normal review period has expired. An example was during the men's discus when Daniel Stahl of Sweden had uncorked the second longest throw of 69.16 behind Che of um, Czechoslovakia, or the, well, the Czech Republic. Um, and, um, video review revealed that his heel made contact with the outside of the ring. So that throw was stripped away and it kind of took the sails of the wind out of uh, Stahl's sails. Um, he wasn't second in qualifying, you know, going into finals. Um, uh, so just the, the, the incredible wide use of video review is something that uh, I think we're, we're moving toward and, and it was very much on display at the world championships. Well, I, since you talked about uh, cameras, uh, those of you who watched the 
the steeplechase and you saw the cameraman standing in lane one or one and a half during the steeple, I'm not sure quite what he was uh, what he was uh, filming, but let me, if you can see this, I'm going to show you, I don't, I can't share the screen with you, but I can show you, can you guys, can you guys see that? If you hold it up more, Vin, we can. There you go. All right. So you see that camera guy standing in front of the steeple chasers? Yes. All right. Can you, can you all see that? Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to blow it up a little bit and let show you what one of the guys on my team at Virginia sent to me. <laughs> and hold it up a little higher. <laughs> there you are. Hold yep. it up a little higher, Vin. There you go. Now we can see your face. Is there anything else in the in the image we're supposed to see? Are you are you have you been made? Have you been made the camera guy? I have been. <laughs> they planted my face on the camera guys. Uh, but hey, hey, Vin. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, how, question. How, how, uh, my my keep raising my hand and then it erases it. I think they're <laughs> trying to tell me something. If you'd like to know what happened with that, I can certainly tell you since I was there. If, That's exactly what I wanted to find out: is how that cameraman got there, and also I saw because I was I watched a lot on uh, streaming on that, and I saw fans coming out of the stands also. So I'm wondering what was going on. Go ahead. Well, take it away, Rory. <laughs> um. The cameraman's job at that point, and remember he had earphones on, was to uh, cover the ladies coming out of the triple jump pit as they walked over to their coach. And uh, he could not hear anything because he had and he had commands being given to him and he was doing his job. And, and as everybody saw, I'm sure, that the steeplechasers came around and had to part the Red Sea and go around him. Thank God he didn't turn left or right. He held his position and stepped off. So there's various aspects to this. One, one is that I can tell you that uh, according to some of the cameramen a couple of days later, that one portion of the camera hierarchy had voted to sack him. And another portion of the hierarchy said, if you sack him, we'll all leave. So there was a little bit of consternation within their own unit there. And the public thing that they said was that uh, the cameraman was doing his job and had meet management done their job, they would have had somebody on the field to regulate the traffic and it would never have happened. And there's some portion of truth to that. The, I, don't, I don't get too deeply into all of this, but uh, to begin with the marshals, because they are differently used in different parts of the of the world and uh, they have other people who do assisting and all of that. Um, we were initially given the task of, of regulating the five gates of people moving in and off the field. We were not allowed to set foot on the track. We were not allowed to set foot on the infield. And so it was quite true that there was none of us on the infield to regulate any traffic. So in that sense, uh, they were probably at least that portion correct. Uh, as probably some of you have been watching, uh, <clears throat> I was uh, on the track, as were some of the other folks, and that was a longer story through uh, stealth uh, politicizing on my part, uh, simply going ahead and doing something, making us useful, and some other uh, uh, scandalous behind the scenes things that I was doing. So we were able to get on the track uh, to herd the folks off the track in the mix zone. We could take DNFs off the track. Uh, we had, despite what had been said in Zooms prior to us being there, we did end up guarding the rail cam that was on the finish line because they said it would be taken care of, but it wasn't. So they actually lost the feed on that early on. So we set up a compromise situation, or I did with television, the fellow running the camera and uh, the ITO and another person to be able to have us be in, out there guarding their camera and not allowing athletes beyond lane eight and pushing them back with the first 
first uh, lap of the long races and then for the last lap as well. And then they could come out in between. And we did some other things as well, which I, I won't belabor it. Um, uh, the, that's the camera issue. We had other issues but do, that we're not seeing and such that we're taking care of. And I think as all of you know, uh, what got done, I think my reaction, I, I agree with Mark that I didn't see anything that was remarkable that we would adapt, except they have a lot of technology and that's very nice. And so if we could get a lot of that, um, that, that would be great. I think some of the things that they did were primarily oriented toward being entertainment. And uh, what so what was different about it was the massive amount of, of TV cameras and all of these other sorts of things. They were very little concerned. This is my cynical remark, because as you all know, I'm very cynical to begin with, that uh, their concern with safety was limited. Um, they were not allowing us to be on the field, even despite requests to guard sector lines. They had where they had. Um, uh, photographers in very dangerous places and situations, and they dodged a bullet, to be frank. And uh, their concern with that seemed to be uh, very low. But their concern with entertainment and the presentation of show was very high. And I think that's what you saw. And, and it, it was good. And uh, athletes did well. And uh, it's uh, like seeing a movie. All you want to see is the movie. And all of you know that behind the scenes, people are arguing, fighting, complaining, uh, complaining about lack, lack of uh, communication and, and uh, conflicting uh, instructions that we're getting from nameless, faceless people and these kinds of things. So there was all that going on, but we do that at every meet anyway. And do you think, we, Rory, do you think, do. That, Rory, do you think the um, incident with the photographer and the steeplechase helped to loosen things up no. and uh, allow you more opportunity to do no. what you should be doing. You don't no. think that had anything to do with it? Cause that didn't was anything to do with it. What have what started it was that the ITO was the ITO for a run, the running ITO who was at the finish line where I was, uh, tried to gather everybody from the end of a race by himself because we weren't allowed on the track. So when you had the, the mixed relays in the first day, all of those people and all the relays, he was trying to push to the infield to get the handoffs out of the way. He was trying to gather them all in. And I went to him and I said, you know, in this country, the marshals are the people who do that. And if you'd like our help, we'll be happy to do that. He looked at me and said, I'd like your help. So we got out there. We, it was appealed again in the ITO meetings that were happening each day. They still turned it down, but they said that if he needed help, any help he needed, we were allowed to do. So I stretched that to the limit and we did a lot of things under the guise of the running ITO, who was very um, helpful. But the, the, the camera incident wasn't, wasn't one of those. We still never got out there. I was out there once for something they needed to do. But other than that, we weren't allowed out there, even, even though requests were coming in for us to be out there from, from the officials. But I think our officials... It was done on the backs of our officials. And I mean that in a good way. And uh, we were good. We did a great job. We all did a great job, you know, and, uh, and, and that's what made the movie. So we have a fellow official, uh, Bob Langenbach and his wife, Carol, were there with Lori and Gwen Robertson from Seattle area. And uh, uh, Bob uh, is a long, long time uh, field event official has a love for hammer and they had come down in particular to see hammer so bob um what we've been talking about here is presentation uh what the world's uh, uh organization bring had brought to the meet was a lot of emphasis on that and the show so how do things look to you from the stands well <clears throat> viewing the field events is better from the second level in the stadium, but the first level is pretty, really pretty good. Uh, we were over on the near the 1500 start most of the times, except a couple of times we sneaked in some seats over the uh, on the west side to watch uh, morning events like the decathlon stuff. But I thought the throws in particular went extremely well, very well marked into the I was impressed by the athletes or the officials who were marking in the field and the uh, 
the only concern I was as I was just ready to question you is who was the one that decided how close to the net the official would sit on the side there because from the stands it looked like you were within we were within six feet of the netting. Um, I, I know that you were weren't you, weren't you on the discus, Scott? So you probably didn't get to see how far the the. Uh... No, I know what you're talking about though, Bob, because when I would judge the ring. Uh, for the decathlon, um, I made sure to test that netting to see what the rebound was of it. Bob's referring to the very fact that, uh, for the most part, you just don't understand the force with which a hammer can hit a net and how far uh, out that net can go. So if you don't have your sh chair uh, back uh, sufficiently far, you can have an unpleasant surprise. Yeah. And, and my, my side comment on that is go back if you still have it recorded. And look at where they place the uh, still photographers. There's a woman who does all of this uh, from for the world championships. There've been a number of world championships. She's the one who brings the photographers out uh, and regulates them when they come back in. And look and see where they place them for the hammer. They were in a group, lying on the ground, on their knees. They couldn't have moved if they had wanted to. If something had come off the side of that yeah. gate, they were toast. And their is their concern is not for looking at, at those things. Their concern is, how does it look on the field? Yeah. What's the presentation? How does it look on the field? And that was constantly it. I was The one time I was out there, I had to do some things with the triple jump women and such that they wanted me to do. I did that, stood there for a moment, got a call from, I don't know where she was, who was <laughs> in our ear all the time, said, please move one foot to your right. They were watching every place that we were they wanted to know why someone was on their phone in the tunnel uh and other a number of other things and those of you who are there know that they were calling for marshals every two minutes about something so uh they were not concerned about the safety i'm sure they're concerned in principle and in their hearts and all of that but in fact uh there were a number of very dangerous situations that were out there and uh we did were not able to adjudicate those and the hammer was one of those. Uh, Bob, to your question, a lot of those decisions uh, came down through either the ITO, there was an ITO for every event, or through the technical delegates. There were three technical delegates which, who were along with Dave Katz and uh, his team who were responsible for setting up the venues uh, and uh, the ITOs and and, and and technical delegates were the ones who were saying, you can be here, you can't be here because you'll block this camera angle or whatever else. That was not a decision made by uh, the actual working crew. Uh, those came from, from well above uh, our pay grade. Yeah, um, Bob, I, I don't know if anything uh, was impacted along the lines of what Mark just brought up or what Rory had mentioned having to do with limitations regarding camera angles and the like. I know that over at Discus, there were concerns about that very thing, about where people could be. For instance, uh, flagging for uh, you know, uh, impending time violation, when we show the flag at 15 seconds, the person who was doing the clock was well out of anybody's uh, line of sight from the ring. There was a, uh, a Seiko box that was wired into the machine, into the electronics. And so rather than having one of the portable clocks that we have, um, it was set up like that. But even if you'd had a portable clock, you would have been in the way of one of the cameras that was set up. Um, and that's just the way those, those things went. Uh, Earl, Earl. Edwards his phone. Uh, Earl Edwards just had his hand up for a while. Yep, that's what I was just going to say. Uh, one of the, the although the shot put went went very well, in my opinion. The when you look at the the format that the world requires of a stadium, Hayward Field did not really meet that requirement. And part of, one of the reasons why I say that is because. We were throwing the men's, we were running the men's shot put while there was discus going on. We were putting shot puts inside the discus cage. We were knocking cameras out of the discus cage 
and we rolled a, we rolled a shot on to Jadari's ankle, which he ended up being bruised. And the format that they would like to have the hammer, the discus, all going on inside the middle of, inside the middle of the field, which gives us big, better, better dynamics to the world in form, in, you know, for those who like to watch the, the totality of the meet. It doesn't really work for how we set up our how we how we have our facilities set up for the way we do meets. We do not do meet hammer inside of stadiums unless there is no other way of doing it. But then if we do that, we have you know ample amount of time of how we run hammer with no one on track. They were throwing hammer with and 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 running long jump and everything, and that's something that we normally don't do. But for the shot put, we took our cameras in the discus and we took out Jadari's ankle. So I, I uh, but those are the things that as uh, if we want to be more into what the world is doing, that we need to f- try to figure out a facility that's going to accommodate what they really need and how they want to run it because. They are the majority on the country in, in the world. Let, let yeah. me, I, I'd like to comment on that because I think that's a, a significant point because all of every other world championship and every Olympic games that I can remember is the uh, horizontal jumps. Uh, uh, horizontal jumps have been in the outside of the track. And as you said, the hammer has been thrown on in the infield, but the schedule did did not have the shot in the discus at the same time, et cetera. But the reason I, I would contend that the way Hayward Field is set up does create a better, uh, a, a better in-stadium experience for fans. Uh, it may not be what the World Athletics would have liked to have done, but remember, almost every track stadium in the world is used for soccer, and that track is used for track only and that's that's why it's set up that way because there was a lot of discussion in the design of the infield of putting the uh even the pole vault on the outside of the track and of course there's no room at hayward field to put on the outside but we wouldn't have we wouldn't have um so we we would not have capitulated to that anyway because for the regular meets at the u of o uh pac-12s ncaas etc we wanted it on the infield. So, and I know that does did cause them problems. Uh, one, one of the things that needs to be changed is that the discuses go over the north pits and they go onto the track. And that's the one time I was allowed on the infield because the triple jump ladies were dodging discuses coming through there. And, uh, and I was there for the Pac-12s. I was there for the NCAA. I was there for the nationals and each time we have discuses going across those north pits and sometimes onto the track i suggested perhaps a, a, a some sort of portable net what they had there was insufficient and we had a girl from cal berkeley hit in the back on the, in the ncaa so the discus is somewhat of a problematic area perhaps we could throw it out on the out on the hammer field or some such but uh, that area just needs to be addressed to get a, a portable net of some kind would be very helpful well, I'm, I, I really wanted to say in the very beginning of this call, and I've forgotten, I just want to make sure we don't sign off before I say this. And that is, Roy, I agree with you that I think the officials did an unbelievable job. And not only did you do, did you do an unbelievable job in terms of on the field, but in terms of your professionalism, the uh, being able to represent the United States, I would say that... Um, really a highlight and I, I watch it I'm big on in stadium and what's presented and I don't think and I'm pretty discriminating and my guess my opinion is that the officials did an absolutely uh, great job at being where they're supposed to be and executing on what they were supposed to do and I really did not see any officials which I always think is a great thing when I don't see anything uh, coming up. I wish one of you had come over and pull the starting blocks off of uh, Devin Allen's lane and made that thing go again. But uh, that was the, <laughs> that's the biggest disappointment. That's probably because I'm, uh, uh, I'm biased on that. 
Well, we weren't allowed to do that. We asked to do that, and they we were <laughs> they was they were disinclined to allow us. I'm sure. Well, and, and I agree with you. I, I I think we I think we made a blockbuster movie, and uh, and I think it all went well. We don't need to know all, everything that went on behind the scenes to make that movie. There we have a question from John Lilligren that uh, dovetails into what you just said, Ben, which was about uh, he, he asked if there was any discussion about the false start reaction time rule, uh, the arbitrary limit that's been set up for the minimum possible uh, reaction time. Allen's was 0.9999999 of um, second instead of the 0.1 uh, required or I think you know what it is I'm trying to say. Um, and so does anybody have any comment about that? I don't think I can comment. I, I, from what I understand and participating in the conversation with those who do know about it, the conversation revolved around some study that was done, but it was done in the 90s and determining that, uh, that the reaction time could not be below uh, 1.0 and his was 1,000th below. And I talked to Devin uh, right after the right after the race later that evening, and he made a really significant point, and that was in his semifinal, the his time his his reaction was 1.0001. So he was two thousandths of a he was one thousandth of a second away from being too fast, or two thousandths two one thousandths away from being DQ'd in the semifinal, which should have been an indication that either there was a problem with the blocks or somebody can react uh, without anticipating because all you guys are official and know better than I do. I mean, I watched that video over and over again and it doesn't appear to me that there was a false start, but you guys know about far better than I would. That study that you cited had a sample size of seven. And that study also included, that did not include uh, world-class athletes. It was the average person. Well, that's a crazy rule that I'm sure that World Athletics is going to be addressing. Cycling had something uh, relatively similar to this where there was a threshold of 50 for um, hematocrit level. Uh, it was determined that that was, uh, you know, the, the maximum that people could have. So anybody who had a lower hematocrit level could pump up uh, uh, through boosting up to that 50 uh, threshold. And then more specific tests were developed and that was canned, was, uh, uh, you know, outdated. And it was, it was seen to be a stopgap measure that it was. And so perhaps there will be movement uh, in, in a more favorable direction or a more realistic direction uh, for somebody who has a tremendous uh, reactive capabilities of an athlete uh, that Devin Allen has. Anybody else have a comment on that? I'll, I'll conclude it. Leroy. Leroy, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Leroy, you have to unmute yourself. Who, who are you? It's not me. You're, you're good. Okay. I've been a starter for 20 years, and I played that back and forth. Uh, his head didn't move. His arms didn't move. Nothing moved. So the blocks only measure pressure from the uh, pressure from the – and that's it. What happens is many of the runners don't put all of their feet onto the pads. Their toe is on the ground. And I think this is what happened. When the set command, he goes up and you lose contact of the pads. Nothing else moved at all. That was a bad call from the uh, referee. How do you fix that? I don't know. Hmm. But you have to have someone that says, okay. That's not a false start. That happened at Stanford a couple of years ago, too. So, the but, running referee ha has the option in, in that case to <laughs> allow him to run under protest if the running uh, referee, excuse me, the starting referee uh, feels that there might be a problem with the blocks or any of the other equipment. 
apparently he didn't feel that way. Hmm. Like and I that's, what, that's what I thought, that he would run under protest, and then they figure it out after that. That's what but it should have been. Good. Only if he feels that there's a problem with the equipment at that level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Scott, well, may I interject on that? It's pardon Richard me? Weiss class. Yes, um, Richard, go ahead. I mean, ideally, one of the starters who was there probably has more information. But I know here in the United States, we have running under protest. And I'm, I, I may be wrong. I'm not sure if there is a running under protest. And if it's and if there is, it's so willingly given in world athletics. Because here yeah. in the United States, we do have a red and white card for running under protest. But they do not have that in world athletics. Again, they can uh, run under protest if the, yes. if the starting referee feels that there might be a problem with the equipment. I That's do know the that they on that start information system, they have the pure numbers, they have the waveforms, but they also have a video that they could look at. And I don't believe the start referee wanted to go and look at the video. He was just said, nope, false start. And that was it. Uh, again, uh, ideally, I know the starters, our U.S. starters discussed amongst themselves what happened and i don't want to speak for our u.s starters because someone like tom mctaggart paul poise tiffany banks chuck estelle Bill Smith, are, 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 aubrey are really the ones to that could better explain it um but it i i i think if if they actually watched the video and it was contrary to what the num the pure numbers were which is what they were looking at a pure number um, they would see that he did not move. He did not come off. There was no loss of contact with the ground, in which case when the video shows no false start, the start information shows a false start. Um, you got two conflicting um, pieces of evidence. He should have just, they should have just green carded everybody. What you did see, what you did see in the video is that his uh, right foot, I believe it is, is turned at approximately a 45 degree angle prior to the sh shot of the gun. So if, if he, most people keep, don't put their foot at that angle to get, to get into the block. So if he moved his foot, the pressure on the blocks will be affected. You could still have contact, but if, if you move it, if you move your foot, the, the blocks will tell you, you, you did. Now, remember, these guys also probably have very fast, fast twitch muscles that they're twitching away, constantly putting pressure in. Reg, I don't know what, I don't Reg know what no, no faster than we had getting to Prince Puckler's every night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, Frank, well, certain things have priorities. Yeah. Frank, Frank Ratty has a comment that uh, I think uh, is something that is well worth talking about. He mentions that there were six events that were held outside Hayward Field. They were over by Otson, and these were the race walks, the 20K and 35K race walks, and the two marathons. Uh, Frank, would you like to say something about that since this is your comment? Um, I just wanted to point out in particular that Ian Dobson, the director of the UG Marathon, uh, was particularly effective in building a team to create those that course, for the, particularly the marathon, organized approximately 150 to 200 marathon volunteers the day of the race that have showed up at three in the morning and put that course together in conjunction with the police agencies and, and uh, other transportation uh, officials from Oregon. And they were just two, particularly the marathons were just excellent marathons as indicated by the, the records and no disturbances of any kind. So I think that that should get, and they were, the thing about the volunteers were they were really local, a locally organized from an Oregon point of view. There was, there was some officials that directed it from international sources, but Ian really was uh, the director of that thing. And, uh, and he should get recognition for that. Very good. Yeah, I, I, I heartily concur. I saw you there 
I was helping to call out lap numbers for the men's 35K, and um, you were there. And I, uh, so thanks very much for bringing that up, Frank. They, they were really well staged, and it looks as though the uh, athletes uh, were very, very happy with the organization of it and, you know, all aspects of it. So I'm glad you brought that up. Scott, if I may interject, before we start losing uh, folks to bedtime, well, at least here on the East Coast, it's past my bedtime. Uh, if, you, if everyone would please, in the chat pod, put in the association that you are joining us from. Uh, I would just like to see some, you know, get to know who's from where. I know where Bob Springer's from. I know where Rich Shorenstein's from. I know where Rory's from. Well, I don't know if that's good or bad. But if you would just go ahead and put your associ your association into the chat pod, um, yeah. I'd like to see how how broad our reach was tonight. That's a that's a great suggestion. Thanks for doing that, Ter uh, Terry Bone. You uh, were helping out with implements. How about you uh, uh, making an observation, if you will, please? Uh, the implements process was really interesting um, because there was about ten times as much paperwork as you would ordinarily have. Um, whereas in the United States, uh, we check all the implements to make sure that they fit within the parameters of the rules. So we use the, the gauges generally um, to check and, and, and we check um, a great number of specifications on each implement, particularly on the javelins in the US. Um, the difference for the world was we had to precisely measure every one of those specifications for every implement and write down um, on the, the paperwork what each of those measurements was. Um, so it, it, it was really interesting. Um, we certainly got very good at using the calipers to determine you know, the exact measurement of each dimension of each of the implements. Um, so that was, that was the one difference. Um, the, the fun story um, from the meet was that um, one of the cameramen from Wales working for NBC um, came into our implement room uh, real early in the meet, maybe the very first day, um, and came in and got just a, a little bit of quick footage of um, somebody measuring a javelin. Well, he was back uh, maybe a half hour later and said, my producer loved that footage. I have to get more. And it turned out that we had that cameraman from Wales in our implement area almost every single day um, filming us, you know, measuring javelins and measuring hammers and um measuring discuses and weighing shots. And, and then when we were out on the field, he would come over by the implement rack and, and take lots of pictures of the implements standing in the racks and take a, a lot of his footage, um, like viewed through the implement rack over to the runway for javelin and so on. So it was, um, it was, very much different. Usually we're very much in the background and oh, just, so you, we had our yeah, own cameraman from Wales. You didn't, and, you didn't have to labor and anonymity as you normally do. That's well, right. Mm -hmm. so do you think the requirements for measuring have helped uh, your skill set? Or do you think that there's something that could be done uh, this, that we do differently here? Or that, I mean, that something that we can do differently? Well, um, of course, you know, the, all of the, the measuring and writing down um, took much, much more time uh, than it takes just to use a gauge to make sure that an implement um, meets the requirements. And so I would say that generally um, at our meets, we don't have the manpower or the time to um, do that you know, detailed writing down of the, the various specifications. Um, but it was, um, I certainly am, am much more familiar um, now with 
all of the individual uh, diameters and um, that sort of thing now that I've, you know, written them down uh, a thousand times. So. <laughs> Interesting. Scott, 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 if I could add something to that. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, when I was in Finland for the 09 World Masters in Lati, uh, they were doing exactly that, entering everything in a computer program, and the computer then did a pass or fail at the end of the thing. And I got the impression that that was their normal procedure in Finland mm -hmm. to measure everything. It, it, like you said, it takes it takes a while. It, it, I, I think uh, that is their normal procedure. Involved. It's also interesting. Um, their their implement inspection kit um, is much smaller because uh, they don't have the gauges. Um, they just have uh, a couple of sets of calipers and. Um, a, a number of other tools, but but the whole thing fits in a much smaller kit than than that giant gill box that we have to uh, uh, to tote around. Uh, interesting. And you know, Scott, uh, Terry mentioned that when the photographer, uh, the video person was from Wales. What people probably don't know is, I would say, eighty to ninety percent of the people who were working for television were British. Yeah, yeah, I met uh, several people from Wales mm -hmm. and a couple people from London and. Uh, and it was fun to chat with him. The fellow who operates the little cart that brings implements back, he's from east of London and uh, over by a place where my wife and I had visited called Rochester. That was, uh, it was a lot of fun to visit with these people. I think I know the, photog the videographer you're referring to, Terry. One of the things that they do in throws is they make people throw, take their warmups in order. And um, the inspect the uh, implement inspector is right there uh, at the cart to check implements and to keep the implements uh, as cool as possible using towels and to check the implements every time they come back, especially if they ding the cage in some respects. I don't know if everybody know on the Zoom knows that the rule uh, in cage uh, throws, so that's the discus and hammer, is that if you're a right-handed thrower so you're spinning counterclockwise if the implement hits the, that side of release on the cage and falls into the sector it's a legal throw but if it hits the opposite side it's illegal well that's a kind of a moot point and hammer because it's going to be hitting the panel but in discus you have to be alert to the fact that the discus can carry them off the left side and, and you know get a fairly good uh, distance in the sector, but if that happens, then it is illegal, uh, an illegal throw. Uh, there's one thing I, I would be in favor of doing that they do that we don't do, and they don't do picking for the javelin. So I don't have to worry about safety in the picking. I don't have extra time for the picking. They just, they came out, they threw practice throws, and then they competed. Yeah. That was uh, great. Yeah, I, I'd like to add one thing that uh, they did, which um, I think was interesting and, and might be considered uh, for vertical jumps. Um, the ITO was the only one who was speaking to them in the call room, uh, which I uh, would that deserves some other discussion. But um, during, for the finals of vertical jumps, uh, he would he or she would ask the uh, competitors, and this was for qualifying rounds also, um, what three heights they would like to jump at in warm-ups. They only got three heights. So um, if it was going to be for the women uh, starting at uh, 170, they, they would decide, we'll jump at 175, 185, 180, and 185. And opening might be at 183 or something like that. It's, but it would be up to them to decide what, what heights they'd want to jump at. And it sped up warm-ups quite a bit because you aren't uh, ha having to change the bar uh, very frequently. That's interesting, Bill. I didn't realize that. Uh, yeah, um, the statement for throws was that people wanted to guarantee the athletes two throws and so what the international athletes do is they'll go into the ring with a hat or with a towel or with nothing at all, and they'll practice their motion. Everybody does that. And then they will all 
pick up the implement and throw. And I kept track during warm-ups when I was uh, first recorder of the warm-up throws. And the person on discus who came in second, uh, Virgilius uh, Alexis' uh, son, he only took two of the three warm-up throws that he could have taken. Uh, it was interesting to watch them uh, go about their business. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to mention, obviously, uh, the three height limit was not something that was done for the uh, combined events of heptathlon and decathlon. And if there was enough extra time after all of the people had jumped at those heights, they were allowed to uh, jump at additional heights if warm up time was still going on. And before the heights even started, there was run throughs without any bar up at all. So, so Scott, uh, I would say last thing for those of us folks who weren't there, that's the most intense meet that I've ever worked. I mean, I've worked pen relays that, you know, you're worn out, you know, because of what is crazy and things like that physically, but it's pure intensity. That was the most intense meet the, the work well, not just being 10 days in a row but it just was intense every day there was just a high level of tension and i mean that in, not in a bad way i just mean you had to, you had to be on your game and you had to be on your game all the time and there's a lot of stuff going on and but it was the most glorious meet i've ever worked and for that i want to you know say thank you to vin and Anna yeah thank you very for much all the work that you did to bring it there because even though i was exhausted and i blame you for that uh, it still was an incredible meet. Yeah, it was a it was a great honor to represent the U.S. in um, in these uh, championships. The um, the the infrastructure that was brought in to uh, to prep this meet was was remarkable. Uh, there was a set of steps that was put up in the stadium area down by where the hundred is. So they removed a section of railing and put in temporary uh, steps for that area. There was an incredible array of power generators that was that were set up. That was set up with huge cables to carry the load uh, for all the different um, um, areas that uh, housed people. The um, there were various tents. The call, first call room, which was out on the field. The NTO's tent, that's the, you know, the normal and customary officials, they had a tent also that was air conditioned. So it was a large standing unit that had a, a wide diameter duct to vent uh, moist, hot air. And that was, that was uh, astonishing uh, with all these concrete weights to hold the tent down much as you would need in Kansas for their winds. It was just it was just astonishing to see what all was done to prep for this meet. Yeah. Somebody's asking about the cart, the return cart that brought the implements back rather than us having retrievers. And that cart uh, is a four wheel drive little cart that uh, is was made by a British ITO who was there and he has four of them. Uh, he has little inserts that he puts in that you can bring the shot back. You can bring the javelins back, the little tubes. And you bring the hammer back that has a little thing for the chain and discus is back. And he puts different inserts in depending upon, uh, you know, what, what the event is. He, he has four. He brought one. And for those of you who saw it on the field, he brought it in his luggage. He actually put it in his luggage because they needed it right away. He came and he wasn't there the first day because he had to buy batteries, which you can't take on the plane. So, and then charge those batteries. So for those who were very interested in that, the, the gentleman was there who created them. He's an ITO, he's British, and he has four of them and they're great. They're wonderful. They only weigh 12 pounds. Yeah. And one of the, we did have an, an issue the first day with the hammer in that they cannot really carry two 16 pound hammers Right. for the duration of the event and it actually um, kind of melted down yeah. uh, it was able to be repaired obviously but yeah it uh, uh, it 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 took a pounding the first day with the with the men's hammer 
and I got on the list as number one to operate it at if, if he went down. <laughs> That's why we were staying away from you, Rory. Nice. There, there, was a, there was an event that had happened or an incident with the cart when he was returning discus during the decathlon and um, the cart smacked into a uh, thrower or uh, decathlete from Grenada. And so everybody was worried about his health and he hammed it up by falling over, uh, which got a big laugh from people and, and he was okay. It was, it, but the uh, operator has said that he was having difficulty maneuvering the cart around all the photographers and equipment and uh, tables and things like that. So the operator is a, a very delightful guy who's very skilled at what he does. And he has the mascot legend often in the cart. And the mascot is a hoot. You know, those of you who remember the San Diego chicken and know that the personality of the person inside is what comes through in the uh, costume, that was very much the case with the person who uh, is legend. He's very athletic, uh, very agile. And there was a very funny thing that happened where there was a little baby that was who was just having a greatest time laughing at legend. So legend became aware of this and made his way over to where the baby was. And I don't know if this was set up or what, but over the loudspeaker came that song from the lion King where Simba is held up uh, for everybody to see. And that's what legend had done with the baby. And that just brought the house down. So things like that, if we can incorporate more things along those lines, in a track meet, I think that would very much help uh, uh, bring along, you know, a younger uh, group of people. Uh, and a, by the way, on the moving of the cart, there, nobody could move a cart better than Terry. So <laughs> up and down hills, across the hill and dale, over all sorts of all sorts of obstacles. Especially the javelin uh, negotiation from inside to outside and return. Yeah. For those we just of, got out of our way. That's all we did. For those of you who don't know about that, this the uh, magnificent facility was built without the ability to take the javelins in a vertical position through the entryway, um, the passageway onto the field. And so there have been some different ways of trying to negotiate that very uh, basic thing. It's just can't have everything perfect. Is there, um, uh, trying to notice in the chat, if I've overlooked something, if you have written a comment in the chat that has not been addressed, please speak up. Stephen Kessler, you have something. Did you want to address that? All right. Well, everybody, we are coming up on 725. Uh, it's a long time for Vin to be on this call. we have uh, very grateful to you, Vin, for taking time to be here. And uh, I'm just so grateful that you uh, have donated uh, this time for uh, our chat and, and uh, for uh, track and field food for thought. And so uh, I'd like to uh, wish everybody a uh, well, and uh, hope that you avoid COVID. There were officials who had been taken down by COVID and had to be isolated. And it was, uh, it was a very difficult thing, you know, the, to have to constantly contend with. Uh, Mark, do you have anything uh, before we leave? Vin, go ahead. For me, I, I just want to say the vision all along was to have this great, great event for the athletes and the coaches. But to me, it was all about the youth. It was also being about the officials, the masters, etc. So let us keep in mind that we've got this very diverse sport. And I, I'm so happy to hear all the comments that for, from the officials who participate, because I always thought this would be something that everyone should be able to take with them. I know for me, no matter all the time I spent in the sport of track and field, it was the most exciting uh, event to be a part of. And I'm, uh, I'm thrilled and I, I'm really, really, uh, uh, I, I mean, it, it's a heartfelt comment and I'm glad that the officials had 
uh, felt it was a, a worthwhile event. So thanks for and, and Jen, uh, tomorrow morning. We have a 15, 16 year old discus at 8 a.m. We're a little short on officials here at the JOs. So we'll if be expecting you. If I can shag them with the cart, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you promised to have it 10 degrees cooler. Uh, Doreen, uh, maybe some people come down from Oregon. <laughs> there you go. Cool. All right. Folks, I, I will be uh, sending once I the meeting is over and I have the recording downloaded. I will send that off to Scott and you can pester him for it. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Well, so, we look, uh, thank you, Ben. Thank you Thanks, very thank much, you. Again, Ben. We're very grateful to you. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. And we look forward to another time in the future. Take care. Bye-bye. Nice seeing you again, Ben. <laughs>